Thank you very much. How's everything over here? Great. I'm going to leave you with a question. Okay. Uh, with a question? Add the question, I'm going to tell you when I introduce oh, you. Oh, all right. I'll leave you with a question. The question is going to be, you can stay on the phone. We changed the slogan. Because you can't sell that anymore. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You can't sell that anymore.
Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody on this beautiful fall, fall morning? Hello, hello. What a great crowd. Thank you for being here. I'm Althea Brooks, and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the Office of Engagement. And it's indeed my pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Um, we have a great crowd in person and a fantastic crowd online. We're expecting about 1,700 to join us online today. So thanks, thank you for being here, and thank you for being online. So we appreciate it. Um, Let's see, we have three remaining more than the scores for you. If you're not signed up, please uh, go to our website and, and sign up. We'd love to, to have you. The next talk is Jennifer Beer. She will be speaking on uh, November 5th. Uh, and we have space for the in-person and for online. Uh, please register and um, share, share the, the uh, link with a friend and visit the Lifetime Learning website for more virtual and in-person programs. Visit us at engagement.virginia.edu backslash learn. Um, before we begin, go ahead and silence the ringer on your phone. Just power it down a little bit um, and be here. Um, we have microphones that we'll be passing for uh, the, the Q&A section. So we ask that you speak directly into the microphone, state your name and your affiliation, your UVA affiliation, and um, please ask just one brief question. <laughs> Hold your comments, just a question. All right, so we have um, Mr. Larry Sabato returning to more than a score. This is his 17th year. <laughs> Woo! He is the only faculty that speaks absolutely every year, and it's because you show up. <laughs> and and you, you say to us you want to hear from him, and we certainly want, don't want to disappoint you. So uh, thank you, Larry, for being here. Just a brief intro, and uh, we'll turn the program over to him. So Larry J. Sabato has won four Emmys and is recognized as one of the nation's most respected political analysts. He appears on national and international TV multiple times a week, including CNN, CNN International, and BBC. A Rhodes Scholar, Sabato is the founder and director of the University of Virginia Center for Politics. He has taught over 20,000 students. How many of you were one of his students? Wow, look at all those hands going up. Uh, so his uh, taught students, let's see, University of Virginia, and has given him its highest honor, the Thomas Jefferson Award. In 2020, uh, 2021, Sabato celebrated his 50th year anniversary of association with the University of Virginia. That's right, that deserves an applause. He is a New York Times bestseller, uh, selling author, having authored or edited two dozen books. I don't know when he has time to teach. He's writing books all the time. He's the editor and lead author of the recently released book, A Return to Normalcy, the 2020 election that almost broke America. And that book will be sold right over here at the bookstore afterwards. And I understand his books make wonderful, wonderful holiday gifts. <laughs> Pick up two copies. Okay, so um, I'm gonna leave Larry with a question to ponder and maybe address uh, while he's up here. Uh, for years he has said that politics is a good thing. I no longer see that um, tagline any place, and I'm wondering why. Why isn't politics any longer a good thing? So maybe he'll tell us. So please help me Welcome, Larry Sabato, to More Than the Score. Nice to see all of you. I see most of you at least once a year, and many of you come to reunions, and I've done all of them, too. I don't know when you started, but I don't think I've missed, missed one of those. It's because nobody else ever invites me, so I've always got open... <laughs> open spaces on the calendar, and I appreciate it. I hope everybody is happy, healthy, and wise, or at least two of the three, okay? You, you can't ask for everything, but two of the three. 
but I've enjoyed, uh, it's hard to believe it's, it's been uh, 52 years of association with, with UVA now. A couple of them were, were hidden. It was like, well, I'm lucky enough to live in Pavilion 4 over there. I've been there many years. It was like living on the edge of a cemetery for two years, uh, as we all experienced. But uh, it's, now I no longer complain when, like last night, students are up marauding at 3 a.m. It's, it's actually good to hear the noise. So uh, I don't know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> And I don't want to know what they're doing. <laughs> so, but uh, they seem to be having fun, and that's the way it ought to be at that age. And all of us remember our college years that way, too. We, we had no idea what was coming, and we thought we were overburdened with work. And the truth is, it was the easiest time of life. <laughs> so, but don't tell, don't tell the kids and grandkids that. Uh, just to answer your question, we'll talk more about why I don't wear politics is a good thing anymore. We used to have a little sticker that I gave to every student, politics is a good thing, and we had t-shirts, politics is a good thing. Uh, and it's because it's really tough to sell that anymore. I mean, it's really tough. So we've changed it to, because this is kind of neutral, politics is everything. <laughs> and I still have people coming up and saying, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, people really want an argument these days. and. Uh, you know, I, I try and avoid that if possible. I liked your, your uh, admonition about one short question, but this being a UVA crowd, that's impossible. <laughs> that, that will not happen, and it's all right one way or the other. Well, look, uh, here we are, another election. Uh, some of you are a little bit younger, not many, uh, and that's okay. I'm with the older, older crowd for sure. Uh, this is um, an unusual election, but they're all unusual in one way or another. I just want to say to the younger people in the room, uh, you've really got, you got a lot of work to do. You know, climate change and the dissension in the United States and all the problems we have from A to Z. Uh, and uh, we baby boomers left you a perfect situation. And, <laughs> The ones that came after us, I forget what they even call that generation, but they're the ones who screwed it up. They messed it up totally. So you need to put the blame where it belongs and none of this okay boomer stuff, all right? I don't wanna hear any of that. But uh, you know, we're here in another election and it is certainly true that, that uh, our elections um, are not just elections anymore. They're really a, a read on, on society and how it's dealing with uh, our problems and what it thinks of the American Republic and maybe how we're, we've got to change it in order to preserve it. Um, just not to start on a negative note, but right after the 2020 election, we did a thorough study through the Center for Politics on uh, Americans' views toward one another as well as toward politics. And the most disturbing finding was that a a solid majority of those who voted for Trump want the blue states to secede from the union. They do not want the blue states in the union. But 42% of the Biden voters want the red states to secede from the union. See, this is not good. You know, this, is, this does not augur well for the future. And we, we all have to work together to change that. I mean, at the very least, <laughs> I thought we resolved that in the 1860s, but uh, maybe they're not teaching history anymore. It maybe offends people, you know, that's, that's the way it is these days. But uh, we do have to do something, all of us have to do something about that, try to bring people back together to the extent we can. We're always gonna disagree about a thousand things, that's very American, but you disagree with words and you, know, you write letters and you write articles and you, know, you have group meetings, but you don't break into somebody's home and beat them with a hammer. See, that's, that's a bad way to express your opposition. Of course, part of that, I'm sure, is mental illness. And there's a lot of that, too. Um, so we got a lot of problems to solve. And it's on you young people, so get with it. <laughs> I've done my bit, okay? And now, you know, these are retirement years, except I'm not retired. <laughs> that's funny. Okay. Anyway, we always do crystal ball, and this, I don't want to emphasize the division, but it's present. You can't do a political analysis without talking about the deep divisions in American society. 
and I'm going to show it in several ways, um, not all at once, but this is the uh, party control of state legislatures as it exists right now. And no, Nebraska didn't disappear into the center of the earth. It has a unicameral, nonpartisan legislature, except we know the party ID of every single member of the, uh, of the legislature. And, but we can't list it. It's actually Republican, so it really should be red, but you can't do that because they get very upset uh, if you, if you stop. <laughs> All the red states have uh, one party controlling both houses of the state legislature, and most of them have uh, a Republican governor as well, okay? Uh, the uh, blue states all have uh, both houses controlled by Democrats, and most of them have Democratic governors. They have the trifecta, as it's called. But this is just legislatures. Do you notice there, there are three purple states? Virginia's one of them, barely, barely. Uh, by one vote, the Democrats have the state Senate, the Republicans have everything else. But there are three states where there is some kind of power sharing between the two parties. Now, maybe they just fight, but if they want to get anything done, they have to compromise. You know, we used to be very good at that as Americans, and we're not anymore. We've got to get back to the era of compromise when we can work with one another and split the difference. Isn't that what all of us do? at work and, and at home? Don't we split the difference? Because you're never going to get people to agree completely. Well, in politics, not so much anymore. It's my way or the highway. I want 100% of what I want. Uh, and we can't let that continue. But Virginia, Minnesota, and Alaska, actually Alaska has such a crazy system that I, could, I had to color it purple because it makes no sense. Uh, so that's Alaska. Uh, but, you know, that's a, that is a map that suggests uh, division, and there are lots of other measures of it, too. But let's get on to the midterm and the implications of that for the midterm. Now, I'm going to give a magic brew for both sides. This is the Democratic magic brew that would produce Democratic victories, and I'll cover the Republican magic brew in just a second. Uh, Biden's job approval has gone up, but <laughs> the problem is it was in the low to mid-30s, and now it's in the low to mid-40s. That's okay, but it doesn't help your party in a midterm election. In fact, it nearly guarantees uh, seat loss. Uh, that is actually where Trump was in 2018. It is actually where Obama was in 2010 in their first midterm elections. So it's not good for the Democratic Party. It could have been worse. I guess that's what I should have entitled that line. It could have been worse because then it would have been uh, this year would have been a red uh, wave, a red tidal wave. And instead, I'm trying to say it's a red tide. The tide pulls you. The wave sweeps away everything that isn't nailed down. So that's the difference between the two kinds of elections. But uh, don't be under the uh, misconception that this isn't going to be overall a Republican year. It's a classic midterm election. Parties almost always lose seats if they control the White House, and this one isn't going to be any different. Now, the House is different from the Senate, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, there is a Biden disconnect with the top candidates, which actually helps the top candidates, particularly for governor and, and senator, because he is unpopular. I do give him credit for this, though. Uh, unlike some prior presidents, I won't mention any names, he doesn't have to be the center of attention all the time. He doesn't have to be running rallies all the time. Now, maybe it has to do with his energy level. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not there. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, most presidents are at the center of their party's midterm campaign, and that is not true with Biden. He's perfectly willing to step back. He doesn't go where he will hurt the candidate. And there have been fights in plenty of past administrations about presidents who wanted to go to a state, but the campaign said, please be busy that day. Please, go abroad. You know, there are many countries you haven't visited yet. Uh, <laughs> Biden gets it, and, and I give him credit, and I give his staff credit for that. But it does help that he isn't very visible. I've got Trump next, and I'm going to tell you something that's absolutely unbelievable and has never happened in American history. Never. Of course, we didn't have television before the 50s, but uh, the incumbent president sitting in the White House on many days has less of the news focused on him than about his predecessor. Donald Trump has more minutes in all the key news programs added together than the incumbent president does. 
And that's a plus for Democrats. It's a plus. It really is. Because Trump has done what Biden can't do, energize Democrats. Really. <laughs> I can't tell you how many, how many senior Republicans have said to me, privately, it's always off the record or on deep background, I wish he'd get off the stage. I just can't stand this anymore. Then they go out to the cameras. Donald Trump's the greatest president in American history, and I just I would like to see him morning, noon, and night. Uh, and that's part of the problem. They won't they won't stand up to him. Not that he would listen. <laughs> we all know that. But I think it would help some of them and their candidates if they created some distance. You know, it doesn't have to be miles. It can be two or three inches. But, you know, create some distance between yourself and somebody who is unpopular, and he is. He's, he's the national figure who makes Joe Biden look popular. There aren't that many. Okay, uh, Trump, Trump, as I'm suggesting, is a major factor in the election because he wants to be. <laughs> he wants to be. He's only happy when things are swirling around him. His own staff will tell you that. His, his unhappiest days are when he isn't in the news or when nobody's coming to see him or he isn't running a rally in some state or another saying outrageous things that he, that he says by nature. Uh, but it's helping Democrats. As uh, the, the January 6th hearings, you never know what effect it's going to have. I think it has motivated Democrats. They're more likely to turn out. In the beginning of the year, Democratic enthusiasm was rock bottom, and it looked like the red, uh, the red wave was going to happen because uh, Republicans were very excited to turn up and vote and send a message to Biden and the Democrats in Congress, and Democrats weren't that excited to come out and support Biden and the Democrats in Congress. Trump himself changed a lot of that, and the January 6th hearings were part of it. If you're a Republican, I get it. You, you probably didn't watch, and if you did watch, you were yelling at the TV set. Okay, so it didn't affect you. It didn't affect your family. It didn't affect your friends to the degree that they're Republicans. But for Democrats, their blood pressure also rose, but in a way that made them more political, more active in 2022. Uh, so the January 6th uh, investigation has had an effect, but only on one side of the political spectrum. I and mean, you can argue about whether that's good or bad, or everybody ought to be concerned. Personally, I think everybody should be concerned that we nearly had a coup d'etat. But that's just me. That's just me. I, I get probably it's self-interest. You know, my my entire career is is geared to the fact that we have a democracy here, and I'd hate to see it go. <laughs> then I would have to retire. You know, I really would have to retire. <clears throat> Could you applaud for a little longer? I have to drink this word. <laughs> I'm kidding. She gave me three of these. She knows my age. Okay. Uh, now look, it's just re-arisen, the January 6th issue, because of what happened yesterday, and I don't want to belabor the point, and it was one uh, probably deranged person, although he had been watching all kinds of conspiracy theories online. I'd like to think it's totally, contributed, uh, totally attributed to my doppelganger. He watched all the Mike Lindell videos. Uh, if, if, <laughs> I have actually had people stop me in airports and ask me if I'm Mike Lindell. <laughs> and it hurts because I don't think he's ever stopped and asked, are you Larry Sabato? It's just me. <laughs> uh, but uh, we have a lot of fun with that on Twitter. And you know, I, I think laugh, laughter always helps the situation or usually helps the situation. But uh, you know, what happened yesterday has kind of uh, lifted the January 6th investigation and the whole question of the future of democracy, American democracy, uh, to the forefront. Whether it will have an impact in energizing more Democrats to vote, I, I don't know. We'll all find out in uh, about a week. There are some weak Republican candidates, particularly for governor and Senate. We could get down to the House level, but most people don't focus on their House members. Uh, they vote their party ID. For many, many years, I've said, and I think it's even more true today, that the two most powerful letters in the English language are D and R, and because it determines over 90% of the vote. A lot of you will tell me individually, you know, I'm an independent. Don't fence me and don't, don't color me red or blue. I'm independent. If I had a list of your votes over the, over the recent 
times anyway. Maybe early on you voted both ways, but uh, you're either R or D in the vast majority of cases. Sorry, there are a few exceptions out there, but mainly you're R or D, and it determines over 90% of the votes that are cast. Uh, in presidential years, you'll get 6 to 10% Independence. People who are less connected to politics will actually show up to vote, not in midterm elections. Presidential elections, you'll get, now we're getting, thank goodness, 60 plus percent of people to vote. I'm, I'm thanking goodness for 60 plus percent. You'd think we'd have 100 percent the way things have, have been going, and the more participation, I think, the better. But in midterm years, for many, many cycles, we had uh, we had turnouts in the 30s or low 40s, meaning 60% plus did not participate in midterm elections. Well, I think this time will be a lot like 2018, when it was 50%. And again, I, I give thanks for 50%. You know, where are the other 50? But at least we have 50% now, and I think we're going to repeat that this coming uh, November. But why were those weak candidates nominated? You know the answer already, T-R-U-M-P. Uh, he insisted on endorsing, and it's in Republican primaries that he has his influence. And so he got some very unusual people nominated for uh, the U.S. Senate and for governor, and quite a few of them will lose, and they'll lose seats that Republicans would have won otherwise. Uh, the Democrats in the audience, I'm sure unanimously, would say they don't like Mitch McConnell. But Mitch McConnell has very good political judgment. He picks winners well, and I've watched that over many, many years. Uh, he opposed Trump privately on most of these crazy nominations. He didn't get his way. If he'd gotten his way, I'd predict to you flatly, Republicans would have 52, 53 seats in the Senate. But instead, it's 50-50, which way it will go. It could be a seat or two in the Republican direction, but it's close, and we'll, we'll see how these develop. But partly it's because of weak nominees in many of these states for Senate and for governor. Uh, gas prices down and they're up and down and I don't think it's, that, that's not what's driving the election. It's overall inflation and the grocery store is at least as important as the, as the gas pump. And every time you go to the grocery store, something you buy, a staple you buy has gone up again. And that, that is a frustration to people. Do presidents run the economy? Thank goodness, no. They don't. We'd really be in trouble over the years if they actually ran the economy. Maybe the Federal Reserve Board does or certainly has more influence than a president. But Americans are human beings. And when they get angry and frustrated, they're going to blame somebody. And the most visible person to blame, other than Donald Trump, is Joe Biden. And he's there. And that's part of the deal. When conditions are good, you get praised, your party does well. When conditions are bad, you're condemned and your party does poorly. And that's uh, operating pretty much the same way this year to one degree or another. The pandemic is not really an issue. It's faded as an issue. I, it's certainly faded as a pandemic, but not completely. There's still uh, problems and we could have had a, a serious uh, wave uh, this fall, as some of the, some of the uh, professionals believe, but we haven't had it. Maybe it'll come after the election, but it's just not a factor in this. Finally, the Democrats got their act together and passed some big bills. They did pass a couple early in Biden's term, but for a year they just sat around fighting with one another and Democrats were parading from microphone to microphone condemning one another and it didn't help uh, Democratic candidates. Well, in August, they got the big one together, the Inflation Reduction Act. It actually has relatively little to do with inflation, but it's very important to name an act, you know, I love puppies and mothers act, you know. And then most people say, I really like that. That's a, that's a good bill, I have no idea what's in it. But it uh, sounds great. Uh, but you know, there's a lot in there, whether you like it or dislike it, and so Democrats have something to sell to their own constituents and to excite them again. It was the lack of this passage that beat Terry McAuliffe as much as anything. The Democrats had nothing to offer other than internal strife, and that doesn't sell well. It, it depresses your own partisans, and it excites the other side because they have something to say about the fact that you're not producing. Uh, but the main one I say for last, you all know this, uh, it's the overturning of Roe v. Wade that really energized Democratic troops, the Dobbs decision in June. Uh, now, you know, would it, would it have been an even bigger factor if, 
If the decision had come two weeks ago, of course. You know, the closer to election day, the better. It's amazing how quickly people forget things or they move on to something else. But this one has lasted longer than most. Most things that were an issue in June have faded. This one has not, and it is generating more Democratic votes uh, in various places. I mean, when you have Kansas, which is overwhelmingly Republican, voting 59% pro-choice effective, it tells you that the issue is not purely partisan, that it goes beyond partisanship. Issue that, that's the kind of issue that can actually lift a party and candidate. So it is helping Democrats in, in a number of places, not everywhere. It doesn't help in the Deep South. It doesn't help in, in uh, some of the conservative Midwestern states, but again, Kansas would suggest that it helps in places you wouldn't expect. Now, for the Republicans, it's a shorter list because they're the out-of-power party. And normally, an out-of-power party focuses on just a few things, and it works. They don't have to have a message all over the lot. They just, they just keep uh, their vision focused on what they think will, will work. Obviously, there's Biden, uh, high inflation, and I guess we can cross out maybe recession, because that's after the, the election. There, obviously, there's no recession with the 2.6% growth in GDP. Have, if it had been negative for a third quarter, boom. And then we would have talked about recession. And people have said to me, well, but people know that's coming. What many of these professional groups have said it's coming. Economists have said it's coming. And it's true. I've talked to two economists. I got four opinions. They have four hands. Uh, and three of the four hands agreed that we're going to have at least a mild recession next year. People don't vote on the future like that. You may think they should. I may think they should. But they don't. And so it, that is not a factor, but inflation is a giant factor. Immigration really bo uh, boils down to border security, and that affects states in the, in the South and Rocky Mountain area. And yes, it is having an impact. It will have an impact. It's helping Republicans in Arizona. It's helping them in Texas. In the end, I don't think Texas will be that close, uh, as it usually is not, though once again I hear, it's turning blue, it's turning blue, it's turning blue, and I'm turning blue from hearing this <laughs> Cycle after cycle after cycle. I always ignore it, and I'm going to do the same thing now with Florida. That's, that's pretty much over for a generation, as it is in Ohio, as it is in Iowa. There are states that regularly voted Democratic that are now voting Republican, and there are states that regularly voted Republican that are now voting Democratic, occasionally at least, like Arizona, though this year may be different. Okay, uh, culture wars are back, crime, <laughs> although, you know, cuts both ways, but Republicans have been focusing on, uh, on crime a lot, but it's supplementary to uh, Biden and high inflation. And the, the, the uh, history is stacked in favor of the Republican Party because it's a midterm year. We don't need to go over that. Biden, Biden has been unpopular since the Afghanistan withdrawal. That was the key moment when the lines crossed. The, the blue line is approval, the red line is disapproval. Other things have played into it. What has surprised me is that his, his ratings have been uh, inelastic. They have not changed with positive development. Sometimes that happens with a president. And I've heard people say, well, he's clearly a one-termer. He may be because of age. Maybe he won't run again. Maybe Mrs. Biden will threaten to leave him if he runs again. I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear what the real story is behind the scenes, but I don't even think the staff knows that. But uh, one thing that you need to remember is all of us in the analysis business said the very same thing after the 2010 election because, of course, Obama's uh, party was smashed. The Democrats were smashed in 2010, lost 63 House seats. Republicans are going to gain House seats. They're not going to gain 63 or anything close to it. One term Obama, one term Obama turned into two term Obama, you know. Bill Clinton, 1994, it was so bad for him, the Gingrich Revolution, so many seats lost all over the country, and not just in Congress, but state legislatures and so on, that Clinton was forced to hold a press conference explaining why the presidency was still relevant. Remember that? Well, some of you don't. You're too young. But others will, <laughs> others will remember. Others maybe tried to forget everything about Clinton. But it happened. Just take my word for it. Google it. Google it. Uh, and what happened? Clinton was reelected handily in 1996. A lot changes in two years. And actually, for Biden or the Democratic nominee, it is a plus to have a Republican Congress. 
because they're going to do some unusual things. You know, both parties do when they get into power and they're feeling their oats. And I don't think they'll try and impeach Biden. Some of the members want to, but it's silly. And they know it'll fail. The whole point of it is, is, is ridiculous because you don't have the numbers in the Senate to convict a president. You're not going to have it for either party because R and D are so powerful as letters in the English language. Uh, but they will do some unusual things because, as you're going to see after Election Day, you don't follow the individual House races because you're sane. But that's what we do at the Center for Politics. And let's just put it this way. Marjorie Taylor Greene and company, which includes the congressman in this district, uh, have a lot of reinforcements coming. I mean, there are some nutty, nutty people who are going to be in the House, supplementing the ones that are already there. Now, we'll survive. We'll survive because there are 435 members. Same in the Senate. You can have, you know, a half a dozen nut cases, but there are 100 senators. All right? So we survive. We always have. I think we will despite all of our current problems. But it gives a party a bad image because the news media always focuses on the outliers. Whether it's on the left or the right, they focus on the outliers because it's, it's newsy. It attracts eyeballs because people's blood pressure goes up and people throw things at the TV, but they don't break it and if they do, they get a new TV. So it doesn't really cost them anything. And that's what's coming after, after this election. Uh, this is reinforcing the first uh, map that I showed you. In the 70s, 60s and 70s, for example, uh, many, many states had one Democrat and one Republican representing them in the Senate. Some states, the smaller states, did that on purpose. They liked to have at least one representative or senator in each party caucus because they didn't have clout. And this way they would have somebody arguing for whatever it is they needed and wanted. Well, that's gone, again, because of the power of D and R. And you look at the map, the red states there, two Republican senators. The blue states there, two Democratic senators. You've got six states with a Democrat and a Republican, and several of them are going to be disappearing uh, in the next few years, like West Virginia, which will be two Republicans, Montana, which will be two Republicans, Maine eventually probably will be two Democrats. So you're going to have even more states uh, aligned very, very firmly with one party. And the governors are a little bit different. People vote on the basis of of uh, ability and you know whether they trust somebody or not because they actually matter you know senators talk and governors do uh, so they're, they're more serious about their gubernatorial votes but unfortunately in a large majority of the cases those same colors apply to the governors and the state legislatures as well so that's another way in which we're becoming two countries okay now and now we're getting to the stuff that you're actually interested in uh, Senate projections, and I go back and forth on this depending on the day uh, and who I've talked to and what new polls have come out, and I ignore the partisan ones, which are now included, unfortunately, in the 538 average and the real clear politics average. The only reason you have these partisan polls is they're flooding the zone. They're trying to affect the average. Their partisan candidate always does better in their polls. How about that? because they model the electorate to produce a Republican victory or at least a closer race or a Democratic victory or a closer race. So look at the, at the totals. Yesterday, 75% uh, of the polls listed for that day across the country in those two uh, polling average sites were partisan polls. So it doesn't help very much. And one reason is because you don't have nearly as many polls being taken by universities. There are real consequences for a university if you get a poll wrong. And, and believe me, nobody's trying in a university to get it wrong because they want to be right, first of all, for their ego, and second, they want to make sure there are no consequences uh, financially or in terms of appropriations or whatever it may be for their university. So they've just cut it out. They've just cut it out. Now you're left with a handful of polling organizations because it is so difficult now to poll accurately. Even when you spend a lot of money and you really try, it's very difficult because more and more people are refusing
to participate in the polls, whether it's by phone or it's more difficult to recruit people online. They don't do in-person polling anymore. Gallup used to. We had a woman in my neighborhood when I was growing up who never failed to work into the conversation that Mr. Gallup had come to interview her. Well, it was a, an employee of the Gallup organization, but <laughs> back in those days, and this is incredible, they, they would make an appointment by phone or mail, and they would, they would send a couple of uh, representatives to your home, and they would spend an hour and a half or two hours questioning you and showing you various participation devices like the feeling thermometer. Do you feel cold toward this person or hot? Where? How hot do you feel? And, you know, and, and people would do it because it was a status symbol. That's why this woman told us every single week that she had been interviewed by Mr. Gallup. Well, that's gone. You know, people don't have the time, they're not interested, or they're angry at the news media sponsoring the polls, so you can't get a representative sample very, very easily. I'm going to depart just for one second. You know, uh, we talk about what we can do to change things, and part of it is getting people civically educated. And at the Center for Politics, for, for the 25 years we've been in business, we focused on uh, young people from kindergarten through high school and teaching them the basics of civics. And we have many ways to do it, and the teachers always are happy to get it because it's free, uh, and the superintendents love it because it's free. Uh, and also, I'd like to think it's because it's good materials <laughs> about the basics of our system. Well, one of the things we've done for all those years is conduct a national mock election. You all remember mock elections for when you were in school, I would think. I mean, it's an easy thing to do, and it gets you involved and active, and students get very excited about it. You know, they, they know that their, their votes don't count, and yet they do in their own minds, and they, they argue about the candidates and the issues. It's a good thing. We used to get millions of votes cast in the mock elections. Now, it's tens of thousands, which may sound impressive, but it isn't. We're down to tens of thousands. Why? because the superintendents and the principals and the teachers are afraid to conduct it, and they tell us that. It's too political. No, it's just letting kids vote. I mean, that's all it is. No, it's, we don't want to discuss politics in the classroom. Somebody might say something that would upset somebody else, really. This, this is one reason why we're in the situation that we're in. It's very disturbing. Okay, back to the script. Um, <laughs> I just let it free flow. You know, when some of you are older like me. You know how it is, stream of consciousness. You know, I like to think I'm sitting at the Thanksgiving table. And I'm, I'm telling old stories and new things that happened and imaginations and so on. Okay. Uh, we've, we've got some very close races. Pennsylvania, we're following that on an hourly basis because at one time, the Democrat was likely to win, in part because the Democratic candidate for governor was winning, running away, and that'll add a point or two or three to a candidate for Senate. But I'm sure you all have been following that race, and quite a few of you, I'm sure, watched that one debate between Dr. Oz and uh, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman. And with all respect and understanding that he had a stroke and, and so on, to me, the lesson was, my friend, you should have dropped out after the stroke. Uh, it, was, it was embarrassing. You know, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. It was embarrassing. I felt badly for him. It turns out it hasn't affected the polls because people didn't watch in Pennsylvania. They read the headlines, you know, and they saw the TV reports, and you know how it is. They take a sound bite here and a sound bite there and a sound bite over here, and it looks normal. It wasn't normal. It wasn't normal. And so um, that has clearly uh, tightened up and closed, and, and now it is entirely possible that Oz will end up winning it, which he would not have won had, I think, Fetterman been in normal shape. Uh, but those are the breaks in politics. There's nothing fair about politics. Uh, I'm not predicting that yet, but we, we're watching, and we, you know, something's got to stop the closing, or boom, Rich Gordon up here uh, is very active in uh, gubernatorial races across the country. He knows exactly what I mean. It's, it's hard to stop the momentum once it starts, particularly in the later stages of a campaign. So that could be the key race in that if it stays Republican, because there's a Republican incumbent who's retiring, 
that could be the key race determining uh, who controls the Senate. But there, there are other swing races. Uh, Wisconsin, Ohio, North Carolina, we've always had them in the Republican column, even though the polls have had the Democrat ahead in all three races frequently, or at least tied, for those of you who follow polls. Now, the reason we do it is we no longer determine race results just based on polls, because they're, they're often so wrong and vote and underestimate the Republican vote. My favorite example is Wisconsin in 2020. The Washington Post, which has enormous resources, and ABC was their partner, uh, did a final poll in Wisconsin just a few days before the presidential election. Biden was going to win, according to their poll, Wisconsin by 17 percentage points. And just a few days later, he did win it by a fraction of 1%. How can you be off by more than 16 points just a few days before the election? And the answer is because polling as a, as a profession has deteriorated because of the lack of participation by, by many people in the electorate. Same is true in Ohio, same is true in North Carolina, so we expect the Republicans to carry all three. If one of the Democrats pulls an upset in one of those states, that could be critical. Every seat really matters when you have a 50-50 Senate. Okay, in Georgia, I'm not even gonna, not even going to touch because <laughs> odds are it will go to a runoff. Odds are it will go to a runoff. Uh, and and it's, it's very close. There are some polls that have Herschel Walker ahead even after all the scandals. In fact, I've been telling people if there's one more scandal on Walker, he'll win going away. <laughs> I'm serious. Don't, I think everybody knows, everybody understands that we don't eliminate candidates for anything anymore. I was trying to think of what would eliminate a candidate. And the only thing I think would do it is murder one. And I'm not even sure about murder one, have to be mass murder. I mean, think about that. Almost nothing eliminates a candidate. It actually will strengthen the voter support and turnout from the candidate's party because they don't believe whatever's being presented. It's all a partisan plot. It's, it's fundamental, and we've got to do something. We've got to do something. Nevada's really close. I, we're not at the point where we can call that, and probably won't until election eve, that it's really close for Senate and governor. It's a Democratic seat, and if that flips uh, Republican, that could be the key seat. Florida's over with. I'm sorry for you Floridians who think it's a race. It isn't. Governor and Senate. Florida has moved into the Republican camp. Republicans will normally win just about everything in Florida at the statewide level. You have districts where Democrats will win House seats and that kind of thing. But Florida's over with in terms of competition, probably for a generation, then things will change. It always, the, the changes always occur sooner or later. You know, Texas is going to turn blue. That was a joke. <laughs> Remember what I told you? Texas is going to turn blue. I'm just sure of it. It'll be after my death, so I don't know when. Come to my gravesite, yell, so I'll hear six feet under. I want to know when it happens, okay? Or send me a note. I don't know how it works. Uh, let's see. Arizona, uh, it is ever so slightly leaning to the incumbent Mark Kelly. I mean, it's going to be a photo finish. And uh, the uh, Republican gubernatorial candidate and the entire Republican slate are a bunch of election deniers. They insist that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president and that the election was stolen. I hope, hope there's nobody in here who actually believes that. It was completely made up by Donald Trump. It was made up. That, that is the ultimate frustration, to run into people who actually believe all of this stuff, and they do. What worries me about Carrie Lake, the gubernatorial candidate for the Republicans in Arizona, and their ticket is they actually believe it. They, with no proof, no court has ever found anything, no other administrative process. One of our own, uh, and a former student of mine, Chris Krebs, was the head of CISA, the uh, cybersecurity agency within Homeland Security's main function is to protect the election system. He is a conservative Republican. He always has been. He was appointed by Trump. He called it the safest, most secure election in American history. I don't know if it was the, mo the safest and most secure, but it was a safe and secure election. 
And for declaring that, Donald Trump fired him on Twitter. Okay, that's what happens to you when you depart from the party line. But it was a safe and secure election, and this is ridiculous, and we've got to put a stop to this and to other examples that are occurring around the country. And don't tell me about how some Democrats wouldn't accept uh, their losses, like Stacey Abrams in Georgia. That's all wrong, too, but you know, they, they didn't stage a, an insurrection at the Capitol. Uh, so that's kind of a difference right there. Uh, so Arizona is very close, and that one could flip Republican. It's entirely possible. Okay, let's keep going. I'm, look, the House, let me just summarize it for you. Uh, the Republicans only need five. As we count them, uh, they're, they're closer to multiples of five. Uh, it's a question of what the multiple is. And it's looking like minimum would be three, three a multiple of three, mul multiply five by three and it could go considerably higher. It's not gonna to go to 63 because you don't have the competitive seats anymore. We drain the competition out of American politics. Most of the districts are foregone conclusions. It doesn't matter. Voting is, is like in a third world republic or you know, the old Soviet Union or maybe the current Russia. You go in, your vote makes no difference because it's predetermined. Uh, but in, in the case of the House, you gotta remember there have been 19 midterm elections since World War II. In 17 of the 19, the White House party has lost seats. And they've almost always lost more than five seats, a lot more than five seats. So the odds are very heavy that Republicans will control the House. We'll see what the margin is. We'll see whether Democrats can keep it to a level where if they, if, if, if they win the 2024 presidential election, they could pull in enough Democrats via coattail uh, to be able to control the House again. Of course, the opposite happened in 2020. Democrats lost seats while Joe Biden was amassing a seven million vote plurality nationally. So it doesn't always work out the way you think it's going to, and that could apply to this year. Notice the Senate, though. Only 13 of the 19 elections have produced uh, the uh, additional Senate seats for the party out of power in the White House. So there, you know, that's why it's different. They're idiosyncratic. People get to know the Senate candidates. They learn about specific issues. And they may vote contrary to their party ID in that one race. So I think that's why it's happened. It's less likely to happen now because of partisanship, extreme partisanship. But on the whole, you know, the average has been about 27 seats lost for the White House party in the House. Democrats only need to lose five. The average loss in the Senate, net Senate, for uh, the White House party has been between three and four seats. Well, uh, Republicans only have to gain one net seat. So that gives you a little idea of what's going on as well. All right, governor's races, let's skip. It's 20 Republican seats, 16 Democratic seats up, but let's skip to the, the important part. This is, this is more interesting. The governor's races, to me anyway, are, are more interesting. Maybe they have less impact nationally, but uh, you have more competition uh, in many of these states, and we've got five states uh, that are just complete toss-ups so far. Uh, Wisconsin is tied in just about everything I've seen, including the private polls. Uh, it's a Democratic governor there now, but he's up like 51-49, so an upset is easy to imagine, particularly since Ron Johnson, the Republican senator, is, is likely to be elected to a third term. That creates some, some coattail. Uh, Kansas, incredibly, there's a Democratic governor there. Uh, she might get reelected. Uh, she's leading slightly in the public and private polls. I'll be shocked, and yet, you know, it's entirely possible she will get a second term, but nobody would be shocked if this went uh, Republican. Though, remember what happened with the abortion referendum there. Uh, Arizona, I. <laughs> I think, and this is not final, we haven't decided it yet, but it's certainly leaning to the election denier ticket, the whole bunch of them, including the Secretary of State. Uh, now, by what margin, I don't know. Do you agree with me on that? Okay, yeah, Carrie Lake is probably gonna be the next governor. Um, so maybe Mexico will have a new province or something, I don't know what will, what will happen. I don't know if we'll keep them in the union, but there, there you go. Uh, Nevada. I kind of think is gonna go Republican in the gubernatorial contest. Rich is pretending not to listen, but no. I, yeah, no, I know, John Michael, be, be good, be quiet. 
Uh, he, he's in my class. Very smart guy. Okay. That's his mother right next to him, so I've got to be careful. Nevada probably will go Republican, you know, so that's, that's one. Oregon should be Democratic because that's what, <laughs> it's heavily Democratic normally. Uh, but they haven't had a Republican governor since the 1980s. You know, sooner or later, there's an itch for change, you know, because problems accumulate over time when only one party is governing. Those of us old enough to remember the one party South understand that one party government yields arrogance and corruption. It's still true. It's still true, which is another reason why I'd love to see the parties move back, you know, Democrats be moderate liberal and Republicans be moderate conservative or mainstream conservative, whatever you want to call it. That way, when you had to switch parties, you know, it wouldn't completely upset your life and society. Uh, but we're not there. But Oregon, I'd say, is probably going to have a Republican governor because there's a three-way race. There are two Democrats running. One is an independent. She's doing very well. She's getting 15 to 20 percent. Uh, former Democratic state senator, and then the Democratic nominee, who's not terribly popular and is too tied to the unpopular Democratic governor of, of Oregon, and then you have the Republican nominee who can win with 37, 40 percent, something like that. Uh, so I, I expect that to be one of the surprises of, of election night. All right, that's enough. I'm not even doing the president. We're not doing that until, unless you ask about it. Then, then we will do because it's too upsetting. It's too upsetting, and you know, you have to go to a game very shortly, and you need to cheer and be upbeat, <laughs> and I don't want anybody blaming me for a lack of cheering in, in Scott Stadium, and I mean that. I'm absolutely serious about that, so we'll get to it if you ask me about it, but as I always tell people, he who lives by the crystal ball ends up eating ground glass, and you need to sign up for our crystal ball, which is free. It's now coming out like three times a week because so much is happening. Uh, all you have to do is give us an email. We never give the email addresses away to anybody. They're our property. No, they're your property. Uh, but uh, please sign up for it, you know, a QR code and, or just Google Sabato's Crystal Ball or the Crystal Ball and it'll come up, okay? We'd love to have you in our readership. We've got about 60,000 people who get this every time we send it out. Whether they read it, it's like assigning 60,000 people uh, coursework. You know, there's, a, there's at least a few who do it because they have to share their notes. I mean, you know that there are at least a few people reading everything. Uh, anyway, I always enjoy this. How long do we have for questions? Uh, ten, minutes. ten minutes. I'll try to be brief for once with the answers. You have to be brief with the questions. I'll be brief with the answers. All right, I've got to give my student first shot here, John Michael. His mother's here. Do I mention that? And his sister. Mm. I didn't meet you, but I'm delighted to see you. Tell me stories about John Michael later. Okay. Um, so uh, usually, like you said, the president is really helpful. But um, some speculate that his presence in Oregon might help consolidate the Democratic vote there. I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Well, he's been there, and I've seen no such consolidation. That's all I can tell you. That's exaggerated. When, when Trump appeared... He influenced primary electorates in rallies. He didn't influence the general electorate. Obama made 19 trips around the country in 2010 and lost overwhelmingly. Bill Clinton did the same thing. George Bush did the same thing in 2006. It doesn't matter very much. And it's incredibly expensive. Paying for Air Force One and all of the retinue that comes with it, the campaigns have to pay what they're assigned to pay. And, and so it's not worth the money. That's my view of it. Presidents don't agree. That was a kind of a joke, but I guess it wasn't <laughs> obvious. Who's next? I'm J.J. Taller, and I am concerned about the fear factor. Um, fortunately, I was able to do the early voting on the first day. But when I look at the news and see the intimidation that's going on, and I'm wondering what you think this is going to affect on the voter turnout, having armed people standing at polling places already to intimidate people. So what's your opinion? Sure. You're mainly talking about Arizona, and the situation there is deeply disturbing because the uh, people showing up at the ballot boxes <coughs> for early voting are armed and showing their guns and approaching the voters who want to drop their ballot off. Is this America? Is that what we do? I hope not. I hope there's nobody in here, regardless of your party, 
who would support that kind of thing? And if you do, imagine the other party doing it, and I bet then you would be opposed. Uh, it's, it's unacceptable. Now, there's been some of it in Michigan as well. That's another place where uh, there are uh, great divisions, and we all have to work to try to heal them some way. Arizona, I'm afraid, is, is a lost case. I really am. I've been there a couple times since the 2020 election, and you know, it's one of the few places where they'd be found in a field uh, later on. I'm serious. You don't want to never start, I, I never start conversations about politics, which means I'm completely silent because I don't talk about anything else. <laughs> Good morning. Goodbye. Thank you. Yes. Um, my question is, you said we have to change things. Do you have any uh, thoughts on how we go about that? And then also with early voting, yeah. any thoughts on how that's impacting things? Well, remember, early voting has been given an enormous boost by the pandemic. It's, it's just like um, online streaming. You know, we're having a hard time, all of us here and, and elsewhere are having a hard time filling rooms. I'm shocked that, that this many people are here because they got used to seeing things on Zoom. Uh, they're comfortable with it now, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, they're comfortable with it. Uh, uh, older people are concerned about uh, health issues and that's one reason why they, they may not come. Uh, so uh, people just don't show up in person uh, as much anymore and that includes at the polling place. And then other people, because of the pandemic, started doing mail balloting or early in-person voting, and they discovered how convenient it is. I used to always go to the polls on election day and you know, preach that it was a good thing to bring the community together. And now I'm a hypocrite because for years I've been voting by mail. It's so easy. You get your ballot, you fill it out when it's convenient for you, then you go put it in a, in a mailbox. And, and there's at least a 50-50 chance it will be delivered. <laughs> And you can check with your registrar. I did. I did for a while. We, had, we ceased having mail here. I think you all know that in, uh, back in September of uh, 2021. I had two mail deliveries in all of September 2021. Uh, so you actually had to go trace your ballot and find out where the heck it was. Yes? You, at, you said uh, you would not discuss the 2024 presidential election unless someone asked. So you're asking. I'm asking. <laughs> You're a devil, sir. <laughs> Everything depends on whether Biden runs again and Trump actually follows through and runs again. You know he can change his mind overnight or you know, over breakfast in the morning. So who the heck knows until he absolutely announces. And Biden, Biden wants to run. If you spent your entire life really running for president, trying to be president, you finally got it at age whatever he was, he was going to turn 80 next month, uh, probably you'd be disinclined to give it up voluntarily uh, unless you had to. Uh, really, it's up to Mrs. Biden. And I'm interested to know, we won't know until probably the presidency's over, but if he doesn't run for re-election, I assume it's her telling him that's enough. You know, we, we deserve a bit of retirement, let's go. Uh, so you could argue about whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. This is a purely personal opinion. I think I can say this as in my 70s, I can say this. Biden is too old and Trump is too old. We need to get back to electing people in their 50s and low 60s. All right, if, if Biden doesn't run, Harris, Vice President Harris becomes the, the nominal front runner, though I think she will face intense opposition. And she's not terribly popular and there are so many people talking about running undercover. Uh, Gavin Newsom's the one I'm watching because he's governor of California. His access to unlimited money, although everybody does in American politics, is a bottomless pit of money for both sides. It's, it's frightening in a way. I mean, it really is, but there's nothing. Don't bother to try and do something about it. It's like abolishing the Electoral College. Don't waste your life. Life is precious. Don't bother. It ain't ever going to happen at least not, not in the universe we inhabit. Uh, Buddha Judge is still running. Amy Klobuchar is still running. Uh, as I said, Gavin Newsom's the one I'm looking at. Uh, the governor of Illinois <laughs> wants to run. He's a billionaire, so you can't automatically exclude him. Uh, otherwise, I would, but uh, he's a billionaire. 
uh, Governor Phil Murphy personally told me from New Jersey that he's seriously considering it, and his wife is a UVA graduate. I taught his daughter, uh, and uh, you know we'd have a contact there. So I'm I'm perfectly happy to put him on the list. Uh, the Republicans now everybody says, well Pence is finished. No, let the worm turn. You never know. You never know what's going to happen. And he's he's clean. Uh, he has the same positions as Trump. Yes, Trump hates him, but then there's a giant universe of people that Trump hates. It's hard to transfer all that hatred to everyone. And after all, it was Pence that Trump was calling to be, you know, he was encouraging the response of the crowd. You know what they wanted to do. Uh, so, you know, I'm less inclined to eliminate him. DeSantis is the front runner, if you look at the polls right now. And a bunch of the people I've listed here, the poll came out yesterday, Echelon Insights, uh, listed all the Republican candidates. There were like 20 some of them. Well, the vast majority, including our Governor Yunkin, received zero, not one person voted for them. Remember, Jimmy Carter was at less than 1% two years ahead of the 1976 election. So it means nothing. It means nothing now. And there will be a cast of thousands if Trump doesn't run and if Biden doesn't run. So get ready. You know, if you, if, I would encourage you to invest in a TV station. They're the ones who make out like bandits. <laughs> they really do. So at Liz Cheney, you know, she's obviously, she runs for the Republican nomination. It's crazy. She has no chance. But as an independent, she actually helps Trump because she divides the opposition. What she takes now, she doesn't get traditional Republicans anymore. I think you saw that at primary night in Wyoming. Uh, she's going to get people, never Trump Republicans, uh, who would either vote for some third party candidate or not vote at all if she weren't on there. But there are going to be some never Trumpers that ta are taken from the Democratic ticket. So she actually helps Trump. And I think she'll realize that sooner or later. She's forming a foundation to support democracy, influence uh, the future, and, and I fully support her. I'm delighted to tell you I nominated her for the uh, JFK Profile and Courage Award this past year, and she won it. She won it. Okay. All right, I'm allowed to take one more question. This is better be a good one. It, okay, you're in the front row. I mean, I don't know oh, what, you've got somebody over there? All right, I'll, I'll do two I, real fast, I real fast. I about your um, perception of the power of incumbency if senators like Mark Kelly and Raphael Warnock are in contested races when they've only been in office two years and so many of the other Senate races are incumbents. Are people doing something wrong? Are people dissatisfied and saying you're good? I just want your sense of that. Sure. Incumbency matters a lot less than it used to. It used to be worth, it could be worth five or ten points, particularly in House races. Now. You're talking about two points. And in Senate races, given that, and this is shocking, given that the average amount spent so far this year by and on behalf of Senate candidates is $80 million apiece. $80 million apiece. And some of them are hundreds of millions per candidate. This is insane. We used to run a presidential election for $60 million. I mean, really. Incredible. All right, your question. Uh, in the Senate, if there's no one sits in Nevada and, um, Nevada and Pennsylvania split, then it comes down to Georgia runoff. So if control is decided by a runoff, how do you think that influences the outcome, turnout, other things like that? Well, the turn, the, if it goes to Georgia and the runoff, they have a runoff December 6th. And those of you from Georgia, would you please change your system? That's, <laughs> that is nutty. That is insane to put people through these campaigns and then you don't have a finality on election night and you have another month and another couple hundred million dollars of TV ads uh, to get to the, to the runoff, come on. I mean, I could see setting, setting it at 45%, something like that, but saying 50% plus one when you always have libertarians and greens, and so, they always take a few percent, come on. Let's, let's do some, some reasonable things, rational things for a change. Uh, so what will happen is, just as we used to have runoffs in the South after the primaries, you learn that the campaign resets. It resets when it goes for 
a, uh, a runoff. So you don't have the same issues stressed in the same way by the same people. Uh, and that's, that's going to be interesting to see how they reconstitute this campaign. But what will happen is we'll all be sitting on pins and needles until early December, uh, at least if we're interested in politics, waiting to find out who controls the Senate after uh, those two candidates resolve their, their fight. That's what's going to happen. Hey, I really enjoyed being with you all. If you have anything else, come on up. I'll be happy to answer it. Thank you. friend and 200 enemies. I hate this. All right. I get 10%. Of whatever the whoever whatever you get. What do they get? Your book. Oh my right. books. That's Someone not worth submitted it. Submitted a blank entry, so oh. let's try again. <laughs> Wouldn't you know I'd pick a blank one? You want me to read it out? Yeah. Chip Coots. Chip Coots wins the book today. All right. Um, thank you so much for coming. And Larry, we have a, um, on behalf of Lifetime Learning and the Alumni Association, we have a little thank you. It's not a tie. <laughs> well, I, I need this election night. Um, and we've got the bookstore here in the corner. So stop by and get Larry's book and enjoy the game. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. The next one? That one? <laughs> oh, that's just the presidential results. Hey, how you doing, John? Nice to see you. Good, good.